Jewel, the only gas giant of the Kerbal system. A planet of immense size and mystery. Unlike every other planet in the game, Jewel has no surface. Only an endless sea of verdant atmosphere. What's really down there? Could we dive beneath the clouds and find out? If you've ever tried this, you know the result is unceremonious. At a depth of minus 250 meters, your brave attempts at exploring the unknown are simply deleted. For the longest time, this barrier has prevented Kerbals from seeing the true nature of Jewel. However, we recently discovered a way to get below the surface of other planets, such as Duna. Could we use this technology to finally break through? Come with me. Today, we're going to find out. In a previous video, we learned that we could give a craft a landed state below the terrain, which in turn allows it to fly around without being destroyed. Maybe Jewel works the same way, just without a surface. Maybe we can try something similar. But hold up, obviously this should be impossible, right? Jewel doesn't even have a surface, so how can we get a landed state in the first place? Surprisingly, that problem has already been solved. Hodiuk has done an excellent video where they set up a floating base in Jewel's atmosphere. Basically, to do that, you just need to take a landed state from somewhere that does have a surface, like one of Jewel's moons, and then transport that state all the way to Jewel. For my floating platform test, I'm going to get the landed state from Val. Using a 350 meter long arm and some air brakes, we can give the platform a landed state. From here we can lift off and take our landed state with us. Getting into orbit is the same as any other craft, with two caveats. For one, we have no orbit lines, so we can't see where we're going and we can't plan maneuver nodes. Secondly, we can't time warp because apparently we are moving over the surface. These two problems make the transfer to Jewel more annoying than usual, but it's still manageable. I've packed plenty of Delta V so we can speed through the transfer. Once we're on our way, it's possible to wait for four times physical time warp to get us there, but I don't really don't want to wait through this, so I've installed a mod that lets us go up to 100 times physical time warp. One spicy jewel re-entry later, we are making our descent into the lower atmosphere. Our goal is to get to an altitude of around minus 200 meters, just above the kill sphere. To activate our landed state, we just need to slow down to less than 0.3 meters per second, and then switch to the space center. As we can see from the tracking station, we've successfully landed this thing in Jules' atmosphere. Okay, now for the platform. I've designed a basic test rig that has a 350 meter long arm with a probe at the end. Using the vessel lander cheat, we can place the rig right on top of the platform. Let's deploy the probe and see if this works. So far so good, it looks like it's not being devoured by the void. Let's deploy the air brakes, and yeah, the probe is floating in the air. We have successfully gifted it a landed state. Let's switch to it and check it out. And yes, this indeed works. At a depth of minus 565 meters, we've bypassed the minus 250 meter kill sphere. Hmm, something isn't quite right though. The probe is still floating in the air. Despite the fact that it should have physics, it's not being pulled by Jules gravity. Trying this a few more times reveals the same result. In fact, every single landed craft is stuck in place, 
even the platform. I had assumed that this would work the same way as every other planet, but it turns out that's not true. A jewel landed state is actually a trap from which you cannot escape. Let's take a step back for a minute. It appears I've made a bad assumption here. I've assumed that the kill sphere is a different type of surface, one that can be bypassed the same way as the other planets. But in actuality, it appears that the surface itself and the kill sphere are separate things. The surface is really just a collider that stops you from going underground. The kill sphere is a completely separate layer that destroys your craft if you manage to get past the collider. All the other planets have both of these things, except for Jewel, which only has the kill sphere. If this hypothesis is true, then getting past the kill sphere should be fairly easy. All we need to do is bring a landed state. No need to set up a bypass rig like the other planets. Let's give it a shot. I'm going to bring the jewel platform again, just not going to slow down this time. And... Well, there you go. We bypass the kill sphere as if it weren't even there. The game is truly fooled. With the Kill Sphere bypassed, we now have a strategy to reach the center of Jewel. Let's do this. Now, I used cheats earlier to test all this, but let's do it properly now. I built this mass driver here to act as our probe launcher this time. With this, we can fire off probes into Jewel at a much higher speed than before. You know the drill, let's launch it. I'm using the same scalable launch system from a previous video. These launches are starting to become more routine, so I'll skip through this. I've packed much more Delta V than I actually need for this mission, so we'll be brute forcing the transfer. To enter the Julian system, we're gonna use a Tylo gravity assist. Normally, I'm too impatient to line up gravity assists for missions like these, but Tylo is an exception. It's one of the easiest gravity assists to set up and gives quite a large benefit, so it's definitely worth doing. As we approach Val, it's time to explain how I'll land this thing. Due to how the mass driver is designed, we need some flat ground to land on, so I picked out a landing site prior to this. We'll be targeting that and using some lateral engines to help us land as close as possible to the marker. I've got some questions in the past on how I set these thrusters up, and I have two answers to give you. The correct answer is that you use a mod like Throttle Control Avionics to handle the thrusters. That mod does an excellent job with using thrusters as RCS. If you don't have access to that, you can make clever use of CAL controllers to accomplish something similar. Lieutenant Duckweed has a good video which I've linked in the description. So that's the correct answer. However, the actual answer is that I'm using just about the laziest approach possible. I just have the engines bound to toggle with action groups 4, 5, 6, and 7. Nothing intelligent here, literally just raw action groups. Now why would I do it this way? Well, as I said, I'm lazy and it works. As you can see, even after fumbling with what action group controls what thruster, I've managed to land pretty close to the marker. So part one of the base is now complete. There's two more supporting structures I want to add, a command center and some extra probes for the cannon. Nothing super exciting with these launches, so I'll quickly skip through them too. If you want to see the proof though, I did a live stream of sending all these structures to Jewel. Link to the VOD is in the description. It was a really fun stream, and I will definitely do more like them in the future. The cannon is ready now. Let's send our first probe. I've built mass drivers in the past, and usually they are as simple as dropping a payload into a bunch of running engines. We're still going to do that, 
but setting up the landed state makes this more complicated. First, we need to detach our probe. It's going to sit on top of this ring of air brakes up here. Next, we'll fire up the engines. The engines are set to have their throttle reversed, so they enter full power whenever the craft is in physics range. This is important because we won't have control over the throttle when we switch to the probe. Next, we need to get our landed state. For that, we need to switch to the probe. Now, for some reason, we're able to control aerodynamic surfaces, like air brakes, on a different craft. So what we can do is command the mass driver air brakes to retract and then time warp at the same time. This locks the craft in place and moves the platform out of the way. We now have a landed state and a clear shot to the 32 engines running below. All we have to do is disengage time warp to begin the launch. To improve our ejection velocity further, we'll also engage four times physical time warp. Now that is a lot of speed. We've sent a 500 kilogram payload up to 10 kilometers per second. At this speed, we'll reach Joule in only an hour. With four times time warp, this is cut down to just 15 minutes. Joule rapidly fills our vision as we approach. What a truly terrifying sight. I hope you can see why we have an oversized heat shield now. The probe needs to endure a brutal, straight down 13 kilometers per second entry. With all the drag we have, the probe slows to a safe velocity in less than 10 seconds from contacting the atmosphere, enduring over 600 g's of acceleration in the process. Now all that's left is to descend through the atmosphere. Once we pass the kill sphere, the probe's velocity is down to about 30 meters per second. Since Joule is 6,000 kilometers in radius, you can imagine this descent is going to take a very long time. I'll speed this up. I've pulled up some sensor data so that you can see what's going on during the descent. Some interesting things to note is that the atmospheric pressure is staying constant, which is a good thing for us because I can't imagine how long this would take if it got any thicker. The other interesting thing, of course, is that the gravitational acceleration is increasing. In the previous video, we found gravity increased following an inverse square relationship, with a singularity at a distance of zero to the planet's core. In other words, we found that it's a black hole. If Joule also has a singularity, then this could get really out of hand. Duna already had some insane gravitational effects near its core, and Joule has a mass almost 1,000 times greater than Duna. As we get lower and lower, it's becoming readily apparent that we are approaching a truly gargantuan singularity. At a depth of 5,000 kilometers, still 1,000 kilometers from the core, the probe is experiencing 30 g's of acceleration. At 5,500 kilometers, this exceeds 130 g's. Even though we are moving through a pressure of over 5,000 kilopascals, our speed is over 400 meters per second and climbing rapidly. We'll need to deploy our parachute to keep descending safely. Let's pop that off and oh, oh no. Hold on. Let's watch that again, but slower. It seems that at these speeds and pressures, the high drag from the parachute just destroyed the physics engine. Okay, those are some crazy stats. G-force was 17 million Gs. The heat shield experienced over 141 billion Kelvin. Now that is decently toasty. And also, I'm not even sure how the game came up with this, but highest speed over land was 1.5 trillion meters per second, or about 10,000 times the speed of light. 
It gets even better though. There's multiple pieces of debris that survived. And they are now leaving the solar system at ludicrous speeds. Perhaps the strangest thing about all this is this piece of debris that's landed on Joule. It's apparently at longitude, latitude, and altitude of zero. Literally Null Island on Joule. What is this piece of debris? Well, let's take a look. Yep, that's a landing leg from the probe. Landed at perhaps the weirdest place in all the Kerbal system. Given Joule's size and dense atmosphere, traditional probes are probably not the best approach. Thankfully, we do have a less conventional option. Remember that other supporting structure we sent to the cannon? Yeah, that thing carries a new kind of probe. One that cares a lot less about a planet's atmosphere. I'll explain later, but first we need to load them into the cannon. The sky crane here will do just that. We'll pull off a clip from the structure and fly it over to the cannon. Here the decorative elements of the cannon have some utility. They funnel the sky crane to the loading dock. Alignment is done through these I-beam posts and a square hole in the decoupler collider. Yeah, so as it turns out, decouplers don't have a circular hole like you'd expect. It's actually square. Pretty strange, but useful for stuff like this. The sky crane returns back to the probe store. The cannon is now ready to load a probe and fire. To load, just detach one of these decouplers and a probe will be pushed off into the center of the air brakes. From here, we use the same process as before. First, fire up the engines. Second, deploy the air brakes and engage time warp. Third, switch from time warp and engage four times physical warp. And there we are, another clean shot. The probe is a similar mass as the first one, so it also leaves at 10 kilometers per second. There's an ant engine inside the probe to perform small corrections. As we approach Joule, we'll take the opportunity to lower our periapsis to cross the singularity. Let's engage physical time warp and head for the atmosphere. The probe slams into the atmosphere at 13 kilometers per second but shows no sign of slowing down. Within seconds, we are through the entire atmosphere and then below the kill sphere. And our speed is still increasing. This probe doesn't care about the atmosphere at all. And as a result, it also experiences no heating. How is this done? Well, the answer is engine plates. Engine plates remove drag for parts that are attached to them, which normally is used to shield engines when they're stowed in the engine plate fairing. Here, all we've really done is attach a fairing to the engine plate instead, and then offset the plate into the fairing. As a result, they both shield each other from drag, and so we have no drag at all. At the speeds the probe is traveling, it will reach the core in about five minutes. A significant improvement over our first probe, to say the least. As we approach the singularity, the simulation rends at the seams. Our speed goes from an initial 13 kilometers per second, to 20, to 40, and then to over 100 kilometers per second. You can see on this frame here, our speed reaches over 1 million meters per second, with an acceleration of 51 million meters per second squared. And just like that, we've passed right through the core. And just take a look at our speed. That is a lot more than what we came in with. 
whereas we took over about five minutes to reach the core going in. We leave Jewel within 10 seconds. Yeah, this, this footage isn't sped up. This is just how fast it really is. Once we get back safely into space, we can deploy our fairing and lose our landed state so we can see our trajectory. It's really not often that you get to see a straight line trajectory out of the solar system. I believe we found the perfect means for interstellar travel, now we just need to find some willing volunteers. Now, shooting at Jewel isn't the only thing we can do. Let's try Lathe. We'll wait around until we get a good alignment, load up another probe, and fire it away. Without the orbit lines, it's hard to see if we're on track or not, so we'll just have to time warp and see. Sadly, we didn't quite get Lathe directly on this shot, but let's see what happens anyways. We're coming in at an angle, and we go straight through the ground and ocean within the blink of an eye. No atmospheric drag also apparently means no water drag either. A few minutes later, we come out the other side of the moon unharmed. What about a more direct shot? After changing up the alignment again, this one looks pretty good. And yeah, with a periapsis of minus 500 kilometers, we've got a direct intercept with Lathe's core. At the speed we're going, this is going to go fast. Oh, man, looks like the game finally caught up with us. It appears that when we go straight down, the ground is able to load and destroys our attempts of getting through. We've got a lot more probes to use, but I think it's a good stopping point for now. So far, we've learned we can bypass Jewel's usual kill sphere with landed state tech. We ventured all the way to the center of the planet, and learned that just like all the others, Jewel has a singularity at its core. With the right aerodynamic trickery, we can go right through this core and gain a massive amount of speed from the simulation breaking down. I know what you just might be thinking though. Jewel isn't the largest singularity in the Kerbal system. The largest one is much further away from where we are. But we've just discovered how to obtain ludicrous speeds. So that singularity is now potentially within reach. With that, I think I have some more science to do. So I'll see you in the next one.